Dear Father, Creator, whose breath we hear in the four winds, truly we are grateful to be here now together on this day. I have something to say. I speak humbly. Help us so that we may all walk a good path on this earth. Watch over us, Creator. Watch over all these good people who have come out here to work together, to live tribally, to caretake for each other and for all our relations in our homeland. Watch over their families and hear their prayers. And Creator, watch over all our relations, the winged ones, the four-legged, the creepy crawlers, the sea creatures, the plant people, the rocks. We thank you, Creator, for your guiding light. We thank you, Mother Earth, for your fertility. We thank you, Grandfather East, for the wind, for the birth of the sun, the moon, and the stars each day, and the birth of all things. We thank you, Grandmother South, for all that is the act of living, for the fire, the passion, the joy, the pain. We thank you, Grandfather West, for the water, for our spirit guides, and for all those things unseen. And we thank you, Grandfather North, for the good solid earth, for the rock, and for the wisdom of the white-haired ones and the ancestors. We thank you once again, Creator, because you bring us food and water each day. And we always end our prayer with the word Wanishi, which means I am grateful. And we say that 12 times to bring it up to the level of Creator. You're welcome to join in with me with that if you'd like to. Wanishi, 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 Ho. So I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the Lenape Nation in Pennsylvania. Um, the Lenape Nation are the, consists of the people who remained here and who never left here. Um, and some, so many of our partners have really helped us tell that story of the people who remained here assimilated in uh, Pennsylvania. We've come a long way. Uh, most of the uh, historical textbooks still say that all of the Lenape left and that none remained here. But thanks to our many partners, in particular, the University of Pennsylvania, um, who was the first uh, academic institution to tell that story, to invite us to help co-curate that story. The story is getting out there. Nevertheless, uh, we are the people who remain here, and we feel very fortunate that among all our people that were widely dispersed, um, that we do remain here in our homeland. And so we're very fortunate to be able to go to the river, to go to the trees, to go to all our relations every day, to be in the land of our ancestors. And we felt those ancestors all along the river as we went down in many sacred places along the river. Um, once again, I would uh, like to begin by thanking the University of Pennsylvania for hosting this treaty signing once again and continuing to sign on with us. Um, just a little introduction about the treaty itself, because I know some of you are new to the treaty signing today. It's important to realize that the treaty signing is not a free-for-all. 
just because it's cool to sign a treaty. It is real, it, and, but on, on the other hand, it's not a legally binding document. We don't do legal, and we're Indians. We do heart to heart, you know. So that's really what the treaty is. Um, it's just a more formal way of getting together and organizing as caretakers, historians, environmentalists, many different types of churches to caretake for our homeland and for each other. Um, we've gotten many more treaty signers this year and it's so, so exciting. But whatever you check off in the way that you'd like to help out on the treaty, that's the mailing list that we will get you on so that you can be with the other people who wanna work either on history or environmental issues. When we have things going on, we're having petitions or we're having fracking rallies or whatever, we can make sure the word gets out. So, um, so it is sort of a, a by, um, a, an agreement of honor, and then vice versa, whatever we can do, especially for organizations uh, throughout this four years. It just doesn't end today and then not again for the next four years. Throughout those four years, we are working together to help get the word out, to come and do programs at your environmental organizations or uh, historical societies. I've, I've been to many of my treaty signers' uh, organizations doing programs this year. And, um, and the word has spread, and uh, we've got many more now. So, um, so really that's what the treaty's about. It's just a more formal way of us gathering together to work on all of these issues that are very close to our hearts. Um, so what I'd like to do today is just, before we get started on the treaty signing event, um, the river journey is a really big part of this. And for the people who have been traveling down the river for the last 13 days, it's very strange standing on solid ground. <laughs> and then, and what day is it? Oh, Wednesday. Because there really is no time on the river. And so that's the main question. What day is it? You know, we ask each other all the way down the river. Um, and it's just, it's been such a wonderful journey as it always is. We were greeted by so many people all the way from Hancock on down, treaty signers and some not treaty signers. It was a true example of tribal living, which is something that I try to, to discuss and spread when I do Native American, when I do uh, Lenape programs in different uh, places. And that is that in, in tribal living, we all help each other. There really, there's no such thing as money, really. I mean, what is money? It's, it's good for starting fires, and the coins are kind of pretty. Uh, but really, not a cent changed hands, except for when we took ourselves out to dinner a few times, we had to pay the restaurants. But, you know, people fed us, things needed to be done on the river, everyone pitched in a hand, uh, we made sure our elders were taken care of, and it was truly a, the, the most wonderful example of tribal living all the way down the river. Everyone contributed their own special gifts to the tribe on the river as we went down. So it was just really a wonderful experience. Um, and so uh, and, uh, what I'd like to do now is to introduce our uh, river guides with whom we would not get down the river safely. <laughs> uh, Dave Simon and his wife, Jane Simon. <laughs> Dave knows every inch of that river and he knows which way to go, when and where. And uh, I'd like to ask him if he'd like to speak a little bit about his reflections of the river journey. we just did was, in our river journey, it started at Hancock. We took a sample for a small bottle of water from the East Branch. And then traveling down, we took another sample of the West Branch. 
And what we did today was mix the two to, and I hope my analogy of, of this uh, you'll understand. We were, Jane and I were the river guides down this river. And from day one, first time on the river, getting into the river on the uh, East Branch was nothing but chaos. Nothing new, kind of. But what happened was, when we, when we got into Hancock and Fireman's Field to uh, load our boats and start the journey, the whole field was filled with motorcycles. They were having a rally, a motocross rally there. So starting the journey was a little chaotic. And I liken this to, to the river, the rapids, and the still water as we came down the river. Starting out, as I said, was chaotic. We got into the river, we flowed down the west, the east branch, came into the west branch. And it was interesting to me that when we got to the main stem of the river, after we came down one side and went up the other side a little bit, just to collect the water and come back down, it seemed the chaos was over. We heard no um, motorcycles. We heard nothing but nature in its finest. And not only did we hear it, we saw eagles like you would not believe flying over us, around us, and just blessing our journey. And it took a moment when we got to that point in the main stem of the river, and we looked back at the rest of the people coming. And when it started out, everybody was talking, gabbing, you know, having a good time. But it seemed quiet when we, when we made that turn, and we were in this pool, it just seemed like everybody seemed to get it. Get what the journey is all about. There was nothing but silence. There was a calmness like you would not believe. And even floating next to friends of ours as we're coming down, you can almost hear their prayers. It was that kind of spiritual moment. As I said, there's been chaos. There's chaos on the river, as I call it, in the rapids. Yet there was always followed by a calm in every, in every um, aspect of it. And I liken this to um, people coming together. People coming together in the main stem of the river. We could not have done this trip without the support of a lot of different people. And it was quite evident to me that everybody's special gift uh, of that day, of that moment, came together at that one spot. But it didn't stop there. It continued all the way down the river. A couple things I'd like to share with you of, of where I was coming from, and I tried to explain this to some people who had come up to me earlier and asked me how it was going and how it went. And I have to say, just right off the bat, that it was not just another canoe trip, okay? To me and the rest of our party, our main core, it was a spiritual journey. In, um, I believe it was Milford, Shelley gave a wonderful presentation to the to the gathering there and the kids. And a couple walked up to me and said that there were, their little girl had four different, no, three different tribes, but came, two were Lenape, and the other two, I forget what they were, they were, I don't know, were Dakota or something. But it, it made four to me, because it came from different sides. 
And I said, can I give this little girl a hug? And she said, oh, by all means. So as I held her in my arms, I'm thinking, wow, four different tribes together in this one little girl. And then I start to think about what journey is all about, coming together in brotherhood. And it's at, at that moment, the, um, the fact that she was Native American didn't mean as much to me at that moment. It was that her blood is the same as mine. It's red. We're all the same. Another, another point I'd like to make, or another um, reflection I'd like to make, is that in that same area, I um, went to bed one night, and uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I heard drumming. I'm going, oh, no, Dan's at it again. You know, 2 o'clock in the morning, come on. And I got up, and I walked outside. It was a beautiful moon. It was uh, some type of special moon. I forget what that was. It was a super moon. It was a super moon. Beautiful out. I didn't see no Dan. I didn't hear anything. I'm back and laid down. The drumming I heard was from my own heart. I think the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, the journey isn't over. Some might think that it's it's done in Cape May, but it really isn't. The journey continues throughout the next four years. So if you were on the journey with us, if you joined the journey, uh, be assured, or if you have not been on the water, be assured that we felt your presence. We felt your prayers. We felt your spirit. And I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you. Before we do the ceremony for the wampum, um, we have an elder from our tribe who is clan mother and uh, who makes many of the decisions for our people in Lenape society, it is the elder women who make the important decisions. Uh, Ann Davis, uh, Dr. Ann Davis, has come all the way from Oklahoma. She is responsible for our connection to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she got her degree. She is uh, founder of the Native Alumni Association here and uh, chairperson and um, is an author of many scholarly art articles, particularly on the health of Native Americans. And uh, without her, we wouldn't be standing here. And uh, our tribe basically couldn't function. Um, so we would like to honor her. And if you would mind please coming up uh, to just say a few words. Thank you. to have some wonderful people here today. I brought with me uh, a representative from the Muscogee Creek Nation in Oklahoma. She's also an interna internationally recognized actor and playwright. And it's my joy to have her along. I'm grateful to the nursing um, department who held a conference, a health conference here uh, nine years ago. And we're already working in terms of the next four years. We're starting to plan the next health so many things continue. I'm also grateful to have three former students from Penn State Abington um, of over 25 years. There were babies when I talked to them at Abington. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm so grateful to have them here. So many good people, students here, I'm blessed to know here at Penn are here today. One of my relations represented. And so many good people here at the museum. I cannot say how much has happened that has made this very space that we're in right now, these courtyards, sacred for many prayers and many ceremonies. 
and we are so grateful to everyone who made that happen. Truly, this is sacred Lenape land, and you are blessed to be able to join with us in all the things that have happened. We miss you. Thank you very much. of our reflections of the river um, we have a core group of very dedicated people without whom we would never survive down the river or have gotten things organized not all of them could be with us today uh, but a few of them are and so we have a few gifts that we would like to honor to our core sojourners on the river um, Dave Simon if you would Uh, as we go down the river, one of our amazing uh, partners is the Phoenix Gift Shop in Digman's Ferry. And uh, the guys there put on a gourmet meal for us. And I have to say, people come on the river just to get that meal for that night. It's one of our most highly attended. And they've got an absolutely gorgeous gift shop. Uh, so in order to support them, as well as honor Dave, I, cut, I bought you a little, got you a little something from their gift shop there. And um, the bracelet that he's holding in his hand, one of our craftspeople um, in our tribe makes uh, bracelets. Uh, that's Deerbone. There is no Dave without Jane, and there is no Jane without Dave, and we're all up the creek without a paddle without both of them. So, it's for Janie, and again, a gift from Phoenix. And we have Danny Reese, who sang us all down the river. So many wonderful ceremonial songs, taking off in the morning, giving us blessing, going to sleep at night, dinner time. And Danny, I'm going to let you choose from whichever of these you would like. Except for one. This or this? This or this? This. You see when you like. Which speaks to you? the second part of our uh, day which will uh, involve the passing of the wampum. This is a ceremonial process and so I would like to call Danny, our ceremonial singer, to give us a song to begin. Hey, 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 hey,
types of wampum can also have woven into them the history of a certain people or a certain tribe. Some of you may be aware of the wampum belts that were passed on from William Penn to the Lenape people when he first arrived here. <clears throat> so it's part of our treaty signing um, event to uh, pass the wampum on to a partner who we have worked particularly closely with and or who has really done superlative work as a caretaker uh, of the Lenape homeland or of each other. In the 2002 <coughs> treaty signing, the uh, Delaware River uh, Greenway Partnership uh, had the wampum. We passed it, uh, we passed it on to uh, Delaware Highlands Conservancy on the upper river. Um, the next treaty signing, we've been working with them. Then our last treaty signing, we passed the wampum on to the University of Pennsylvania in gratitude for the wonderful exhibit they that they allowed us to help co-curate here. And we have uh, remained uh, very close in exchanging programs and uh, also doing the blessing for the Native Voices exhibit that they just have up now, which is a wonderful exhibit, and I hope you get a chance to come in to see it. So this year, what we would like to do is pass the wampum on to Delaware Riverkeeper. How many of you have heard of Delaware Riverkeeper? If you live down here, you've heard of Delaware Riverkeeper. Um, so what I would like to do before we do the actual passing of the wampum is to call up Maya Van Russell, and I would like her to talk a little bit about uh, their organization and what they have done as caretakers of our homeland. Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and I really want to begin by thanking Shelley, who has been an incredible, passionate leader for the Lenape peoples, for the protection of the Delaware River, for protection of all of the creeks that are part of the Delaware River watershed and ultimately dictate the health of our main stem Delaware River. We have had a wonderful, wonderful um, partnership, relationship, um, really fam feels like family uh, um, community coming together with the Lenape peoples over many, many years, and particularly in recent years since Shelley's leadership, that, that bond and that working together has just grown more and more close, more powerful, more passionate, and I think more successful. And so I have a little gift for, for Shelley, and we actually, I have a gift for everybody who signs the treaty, but I want to begin by giving Shelley um, what is a river bracelet. I have one. And we um, encourage people to wear their river bracelet 
bracelets so that every time they look down, they are reminded to remember the river in everything they do and in every part of their lives. And Shelly already does that. But, <laughs> of the abundance of life that was part of the river. And they took their waste 
and they just dumped it in the river as a place to get rid of it because, you know, uh, if, I, if I don't see it, it, it doesn't exist. And they developed the banks of the river incredibly, and they filled in the river in order to do more development, and they continued to take fish, and they continued to dump pollution, and they started to dredge the river, and they, they inflicted so many insults on this beautiful river. They didn't respect it as one of the peoples. And they didn't respect the life in the river as among the peoples to be respected and treated with equality. And as a result, the river reacted as any of us would react. And in many ways, the river began to die. And we came to a place not that long ago, in the 40s and the 50s, right, when the, the river was so polluted that People had to look back into the history books, right? They would look back and marvel at the stories about how the river used to be so abundant with life that you could walk across the river on the backs of the fish. Some people would talk about the backs of the sturgeon. Others would talk about the backs of the shad. I guess it depended which was your favorite fish. Um, but the point was the same, right? And these people in the 40s and the 50s, they were thinking, how is this possible? Because our river is so polluted, we have a 20-mile oxygen dead zone. Many of the fish can't survive in our river in this Philadelphia reach, you know, right, right here. Um, the river was so polluted that if you flew in a plane above it, you could smell it. That when these big ships came into the river, or not so big ships came into the river, the river was so polluted that it literally painted, peeled the paint off of the side of those ships and clogged the engines. People who came down to work the docks or to enjoy the river were at risk of getting sick and dying. People were no longer able to take the abundance of fish they needed to feed their families. People had to be concerned about when they ate a fish from the river, was it safe to eat? And so this river who was no longer treated with equality began to react and as I said, in many ways began to die. And then people realized, my God, this river is vitally important to us. This river is a member of our community. We need to rise up in its defense. And people did. They came together and they rose up in defense of the river. And laws were passed and actions were taken, right? And so you can no longer smell the river from a plane that's flying by. And ships do come up the river. And people do go down and work the docks and enjoy the river and fish in the river without risk of getting sick and, and dying. And there is much more life in the river, and we don't have a 20-mile oxygen dead zone anymore. And we came to a much better place. We never got back to the place we were, but we came to a much better place as we came to the end of the last century. And then that's where I think the river story sort of came to a, a, a fork in the road and started to take two paths. And there is one path, one journey that our river is on today that is filled with many, many challenges and many of the struggles that the river faces today. We have power plants operating on the river like the Salem Nuclear Generating Station that because of the way it operates, kills over three billion Delaware River fish a year. This is a power plant that if it changed its technology could reduce those fish kills by over 95%. We have industry every day receiving permits to legally discharge pollution into our river. We knowingly allow people to discharge all kinds of dangerous contaminants into our Delaware River. Our river does still have so much pollutant in it, legacy pollution and new pollution, that you can go fish in the river and you can um, happily today catch fish in the river, but you can't always be assured that it's safe to eat that fish. You have to look for fish advisories to see whether or not it's going to be safe for your family or for your body to consume that fish or how many of that fish. We have um, development that continues along the banks of the river and so people flood because the rivers flood. They need to flood. It's a natural, normal, needed part of a river's life cycle. But when people flood, what do they do? They say we should dredge the river, we should dam the river, we should build the levee. So our river faces many, many challenges because many, many people are continuing to, to not remember that the river is an important part of our community to be protected and respected as an equal. But at the same time, we have another path in the river story that's being followed, and it's one with success where people are giving the river the kind of respect it deserves. So while we hear across western parts of Pennsylvania and in other parts of the country where this horrific fossil fuel industry continues to grip our communities, 
and inflict incredible harm using things like mountaintop removal, where we are blasting off the tops of mountains, or engaging in drilling and fracking, where we are taking millions, and if you talk about multiple well pads, hundreds of billions of gallons of water every day and injecting them with toxic contaminants and then injecting them into the earth. Um, and inflicting all kinds of damage in order to retrieve shale gas. While that is happening, destroying communities, here within our Delaware River watershed, we don't have drilling today. Why don't we have drilling today? Two reasons we don't have drilling today. Um, I am honored to say that 20 years ago almost, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network put, legally petitioned for, fought for with the community and secured a special designation that gave the Delaware River a special level of protection called special protection waters. So when drilling and fracking threatened our watershed, we joined together with the community, with the Lenape peoples, to say we are a special protection waters river, you cannot drill here. And lo and behold, the Delaware River Basin Commission agreed with us, and we have a moratorium in our river against shale gas development because so many people, hundreds of thousands of people, joined together to fight for the protection of our river. We, just last week, there was a new piece of legislation proposed that would require 100-foot forested buffers on all streams across the state of Pennsylvania with additional protections given to rivers who, who suffer from pollution or who are so pristine still that they're identified as high quality or exceptional value in the state of Pennsylvania. So we have many, many, we have at the end of last year, um, we brought the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in seven towns, brought a piece of litigation against a very pro-drilling piece of legislation that would have mandated every community in Pennsylvania to allow drilling and fracking in every part of every community. And we brought a legal challenge. And we had a conservative Pennsylvania Supreme Court issue a phenomenal ruling that to me sort of shows how positive this second path of the river story is and kind of brings it back full circle to the concept of equality between all peoples, human peoples, and the natural peoples. We had a conservative Pennsylvania Supreme Court rule that the right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment are inherent and indefeasible rights that are not given to us by law, but in Pennsylvania at least must be protected by law, and that these are rights that protect um, that, that belong not to, just to present generations, but to all future generations to come. So we have to protect their right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment, which to me says we have to go back to remembering and believing that the river is part of our community, and that all peoples includes not just human peoples, but the animal peoples, and the plant peoples, and the rock peoples. And when we start believing and embracing that again, the way the Lenape peoples do, we will come back full circle, and we will restore true health to our river, which will restore true health to all of us. And so I am honored to be here to receive the wampum. I am honored to work with the Lenape peoples um, in this important mission of protecting our river. And I'm honored to be here with all of you who care awful an awful lot about our river because you are here today to also dedicate some portion of your lives to protecting the pure water clean air and healthy environment of present and future generations thank you
until the next uh, four years. I'd like to invent, uh, invite up here the Penn Alumni Association. Association and from the watchdogs of the watersheds. I'm also known as the turtle lady in South Jersey. Our efforts to restore the river are not in vain. We have the hatchlings who were released in 2002 have returned to lay their own eggs. They're doing very well. We have two rescued nests that are incubating that will be let back into the pump pesting next year. The turtle population is returning and with it all the other creatures in the web slowly but surely. People are beginning to understand the relationship between us and the earth, and they're taking steps forward to continue our work and restore the balance. Thank you to everyone who's here today. Remember, the river flows to Next, us all. I would like to uh, invite up with us, who have been with us now for eight years, the Philadelphia Ethical Society and uh, representatives of the Philadelphia Ethical Society. Now I'd like to invite up the Archaeological Society of Maryland. From the Philadelphia Wooden Boat Factory. Uh, they have a, a wonderful organization here building boats and bringing people in. And uh, we're sort of talking about maybe doing a dugout canoe to take down for the next river journey. <laughs> by the Indian community of PYM Quaker community. Down the river and takes many wonderful pictures of our lake. I would like 
invite you to invite Churchville Nature Center up to sign, who has been a treaty signer since the very beginning in 2002. Next, I'd like to invite Rising Tide Philly. Well, we have just completed our second page of treaty signers. And our last organization for today, unless someone had come in after I spoke to our organization this morning, is trans uh, excuse me, Transition Town Media. before is because this treaty signer has been with us uh, since 2002 and we had spoken earlier so they didn't uh, check in I wasn't sure that they were here uh, and that would be Arch Street United Methodist Church caretake for each other and all our relations. I'd like to end the day uh, with a ceremonial song, a uh, closing song from our singer. Danny? Thank you.